<laughs> well, good morning. <laughs> Woo. You know, it's a springy feeling day. You know, this past week was awesome. It was warm. It felt like summer. Uh, you know, it, it's been a great winter. And uh, it looks like it's going to be a great spring regardless of the climate change. And El Nino and El Nina or whatever. It's going to be great. It's going to be a great spring. You know, the forecast of our nation, it doesn't look too springy right now. I mean, our Supreme Court took a big hit with the death of uh, Scalia. And there's all kinds of scenarios and theories out there. You know, conspiracy theories. Uh, you know, with Obama's two, there's, there's, there might be two more retirees before Obama's session is over and it could potentially bring that number of Obama's appointed justices to five. And then they could get with this new Supreme Court, they can extend it to three terms of president. You know, is this stuff scary in you? Talk about climate change. It shouldn't. God is sovereign. You know, these theories seem far-fetched, but the reality is, you know, that our government is dysfunctional right now. But our security is in Christ. Even the best government should never be the anchor of our security. And because of this, when and if it falls apart, that would never be the ruination of our security. Our hope and security is in the eternal, unchanging God, who's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, whose love for us never fails, and, and nothing can separate us from his love. You know, as Jesus walked in the flesh on earth, he submitted to the governing authorities. The political scene was, was a lot more dysfunctional back then than it is now. Just, just look at the things surrounding Jesus' birth. You know, the king, he found out that there was a king born in Bethlehem. And uh, he, he goes and he has them slaughtered. Babies, two years and under. I mean, that, that stuff doesn't happen in our day and age. Well, at least not in our country. You might go to Somalia, you might go to Sudan and Iran and Iraq and Afghanistan and, and, and see that kind of turbulence. But that's the type of pl place that, that Jesus was at. That's the type of climate that he was at. The Herod that was ruling when Jesus was, was alive and, and, and was ministered was the same thing. He had already, Herod, that Herod, had already beheaded John the Baptist because that John the Baptist said, made a remark about, hey, Herod, you shouldn't be married to this wife Herodias. This was your brother Philip's wife. And uh, the king says, off with his head, encouraged by his daughter's dance. At the beginning of Luke 13, if, if we turn there, Pilate, the governor of Jerusalem, ordered a slaughter of innocent Galileans bringing sacrifices to the temple. And if you look at the historical facts or ideas about this time, these Galileans were just bringing a sacrifice to the temple. And Herod, or Pilate, had these soldiers, Roman soldiers, dressed up in civilian garments, and uh, they mingled with the Galileans while they're giving their sacrifices, and then started slaughtering. It was an outrage, but the, the, the people were outraged, and they were in fear at the same time. And, and then they brought this up to Jesus, says, what about those Galileans whom Pilate slaughtered and mingled their blood? Jesus responded to the national news by making it personal. In Luke 13, starting with verse 1, Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whom, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered, Do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? What kind of answer is that, right? You know, those, those Pilate, that Pilate and his men, man, they're bad. You know, they're bad. They're dysfunctional. They're bad. No, no. He, he points it to the sin. He says, do you think that these Galileans that died are any worse sinners 
because they suffered there this way? He says, I tell you no. But unless you repent, you too will perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower of Siloam, Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Hey, Jesus, Jesus didn't say, okay, it's, it, it, was, it was the fault of the builders of that building that it fell. And he didn't point to Pilate's, you know, idea, you know, I'm going to kill these. He didn't say, it's their fault. He pointed to sin and said, it's sin's fault. Wearsby noted, uh, Jesus went on to show the logical conclusion of their argument if God does punish sinners in this way, then they themselves had better repent because all men are sinners. The question is not, why did these people die? But, what right do you have to live? None of us is sinless, so we had better get prepared. You know, it's easy to talk about other people's deaths than to face our own sin as and, and, and possible death. The American publishing tycoon, William Randolph Hearst, would not permit anybody to mention death when they were around him. You know, don't talk about death. But he died. Wearsby asked uh, a friend of his what the death rate was in his city. And he replied, one apiece. And then he added, there's people dying that have never died before. <laughs> you know, Jesus clears up the dysfunction of government, accidents, and even acts of God that seem to bring about unjust and untimely death. It isn't about politics or climate change. It is about sin. Your sin my sin, not their sin. What have you done about your sin? But unless you repent, you too will all perish. You know, was, was Jesus doing this just to stay out of trouble from the political realm? You know, oh, I don't want to get in trouble with Pilate. I don't want to get in trouble with Herod. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of, kind of stay back and, and be non-confrontational. He's being real. He's being true. Death is not caused by the problems in this world. Death is caused by my sin. My death is going to be because I sin. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus makes it real. You know, when Jesus did need to get political, he didn't back down. In fact, uh, he called out the sins of the politicians. And he even called Herod, his king, a fox. We'll skip down to verse 31. Luke 13, 31. At that same time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I will reach my goal. In any case, I must keep on going today and tomorrow and the next day. For surely, no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house has left you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You see, it, doesn't, it does not matter. If we die because of an evil government, a tower falling on us, or from some natural causes alone in bed at a hunting resort. What are you doing, what are we doing today, tomorrow, and the next day? Is the fox preventing us 
from reaching our goal? Or is it really just personal sin? You know, we can talk about the dysfunction of the government, but what are we doing about our own dysfunction? Did anybody realize that I, I skipped a reading a passage of scripture last week? <laughs> Kat, Kat did too. And then she says, you didn't just miss a, a passage. She had, she had my notes. You skipped the whole page. You know, I was wondering why, as I was going through the sermon, why I, I was missing something. I knew I was missing something. Yeah, but but she, she responded real quick. She says, but you got done on time. <laughs> that was two Sundays in a row. I just want to tell you, two Sundays in a row. I got done on time. I don't know if I'll make it today. We'll see. I got to talk real fast. Okay. It, it was kind of cool when I, when I went to go look at the passage of Scripture for this, this week. I, I go from the children's worship bulletins. I go, I'm, I'm just saying, Lord, whatever, whatever that is, I'm going to preach on that. And then I, I, I looked at that, and it was Luke 13. And the, the passage I, script, I skipped, script, I skipped was Luke 14, 1. And it follows right on the heels of this one. Uh, I don't know if, you know, coincidence and stuff like that. It was a God thing to me, all right? And as I was unwrapping the message for today, it just said, oh, wow, this is cool, God. I said, I skipped that, and I didn't intend to, and, and uh, this is where we're at today. Okay, I hope I'm not skipping another thing. Okay. I might get done on top if I skip another page today, right? Okay, Jesus was speaking to Jerusalem. They were the chosen people of God, but they were scattered into sects. You know, they, were, they, had, they had the Pharisees, they had the Sadducees, they had the Essens. Baptists, Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Reformed, non-denominational. Are we gathering this? Did you hear about the, the man that, that got shipwrecked on a deserted island and he was there for a long time and then finally uh, he hailed down a, a sh passing by ship. And then the captain of the ship uh, came by and he, and with the rescuers and they came on the island and he says, wow, man, you were here for a long time. That's a, these, are, these are cool what you got built, you know. He had three buildings built. He says, what's that one? And the man says, that's my home. He says, what's that really nice building over there? He says, that's my church. He says, what about that one over there? And he says, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> Churches divide over indistinguishable ways at first. And then the point of division becomes so pronounced that it's a, the, a unique brand of doctrine, worship, or preference, or, or even the personality differences that is rehearsed over and over and over again, that, that pretty soon that, that way, that trail, becomes a rut. And pretty soon that rut becomes a ditch, and we get stuck in it. And Jesus is sitting there saying, I want you to gather you, but we're... And he was saying that to Jerusalem. Jerusalem! I wanted to gather you, but you were not willing. And then we look at the church today. You know, those ruts do not lead to the wings of Jesus. And eventually those ruts, like I said, turn into a ditch and we get stuck. And no matter how hard you press on the gas... You're not going to get out. You know, that, that's where I was when I talked about being in a ditch last week. When I skipped over was what I needed to recognize that even though my speedometer was reading 100 in forward and reverse, <laughs> I was going zero. I was stuck. I was high centered. My wheels were... In the air, spinning on ice. You know, if you spin the tires enough in, in ice, you can actually smell burnt rubber. <laughs> ah, this is crazy, huh? 
Uh, what I needed to recognize is that it wasn't, it was going to be a miserable night, cold, if I didn't get any help. You know, I ended up there because I was going too fast for conditions. And I didn't see far enough ahead or, you know, <laughs> I was blind. It was dark. And the ice. And then the ditch. Please, let's continue to, to read the next chapter. We'll, we'll just turn there. You know, people don't intend to go to the, in the ditch. I didn't intend to go in the ditch. Hey, yeah, I'm going to go in the... You know, there's a saying that the path to hell is full of good intentions. Is lined with good intentions. And we get on these rabbit trails. You know, a free will, election, and, and uh, tongues, and baptism. And, and with the help of slippery arrogance and unforgiveness, we just, we just keep on that path until, hey, we're off. We're gone. Rather than be drawn to the wings of Jesus on clear doctrine, love, and unity, forgiveness, as, as many members with diverse opinions and perspectives, personalities, and giftedness, many scatter into the ditches away from Him. You know, many talk about Islamic extremists. Well, there's Christian extremists. You know, to this community's credit, I want, I want to say that our churches work together very well. Our VBS and everything like that. I, I think we're on the right track. I, I think we're gathering together as, as, as Jesus intended. You know, this church has learned that there's a bond stronger than any differences. And may this increase more and more. We've still got some work to do. I know we do. But this is, this is kind of the big picture. But, you know, look, I, I, I liked this. Uh, my my son-in-law sent this to me. And, uh, you know, it's, there's, a, there's, there's ways to be ditched in our society. And there's a way to, you know, when you're, when you're playing golf, how many of you guys like to play in, in the rough on both sides? Okay, how many of you do anyway? <laughs> you know, I hate it when I, when I hit the ball and it goes in the rough on that side and then I went trying to go, okay, I'm going to get in the green. I'm going to get in the fairway. Pew, and then it goes shh, just straight across the, the fairway into the other ditch. You know, and sometimes that's the way we, we are as Christians. You know, God wants us to be in the fairway. Yeah, this, is the, this is where God wants us. He wants us in the middle. But we get caught up in our, our ditches and our, and our ways of thinking. And, and I, I like this, you know. It, we need to have, be people of integrity, you know. Not corruption or legalism. Uh, foolishness. We get foolheartedly. But there's discernment. And then we get judgmental. Yeah, can, you, can you follow that? Isn't that cool? I won't go through all of them because I want to get done on time. Um, but this is kind of the big picture. But let's bring that scenario a little closer to home. It isn't only doctrines and church-related issues that divide. Sometimes it's hurts. Sometimes it's injustices. Sometimes it's frustration or, or, or just plain old fear. That, that can cause ditching reactions that divide. The conditions of our paths are not always the best, and it, it's easy to fall into the rut of our own narrow opinions and get stuck, get lost, or get shipwrecked. Right is not always as easy to pin down as a mathematical equation. Right is not as easy to pin down as a mathematical equation. My, one of the, the wise sayings that uh, my son's father-in-law said at their wedding day was, you can be right or you can be happy. And there's some truth in that. Solomon made, it clear, made, it, made this clear in his wisdom of what to do with the dead baby and the live baby. Says you want, you want to be fair. 
I'll just cut both babies in half. Two halves don't make a whole. Okay, mathematically, yes. But not when it comes to life. Not when it comes to, to being together and unified. You know, as much as we like to try to logically discern the mysteries of God, uh, God explicitly says over and over again, my ways are past finding out. I'm unfathomable. But that's exactly where we start to go and say, this is what out my view of God is. That's their view of God. And we divide. This is my way of thinking. And, and, and there's all, I mean, there's so many things that we divide over. And Jesus says, I long to gather you under my wings. But you were not willing. You're just going your own way. You know, we're the mysterious body of Christ and too often we use the sword of truth to divide instead of heal. And when you cut the baby in half, how long is that baby going to live? When you divide the church of God, whatever it is, how long is it going to live? Two halves don't make a whole. Not a live whole. Too often we get caught up in the muddied waters of extreme narrow-minded doctrine that, that we throw out the baby with the bath water. Maybe we need to give up the live half to keep it whole. Jerusalem and, and some of the religious leaders warned Jesus of Herod's death threat. They were stuck in their own rut. You know, a, a rut is, is a grave with both ends kicked out. You see, it's not falling into the ditch that is the worst, but staying where you fell. You know how... I've often longed to gather you like a hen gathers its chicks underneath its wings, but you were not willing. Look at what you call home. Has it left you desolate? If it happened to the Bible teachers and the scholars in Jesus' day, can it happen to the church-going, Bible-reading Christians of today? Yeah. Reading the passage that I missed last week, Luke 14, verse 1. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts of the law, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him away. Then he asked them, If one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? And they had nothing to say. Please let's turn to 1 Corinthians 1, 9. You see, it's not falling into the ditch that is the worst, but staying where you fell. You know, when I was stuck in the ditch, I needed to recognize that I was stuck. My car had left me in a desolate place. I, <laughs> it was going to be really bad. I suffered from dropsy. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe not the dropsy this guy suffered from, but my car dropped in the ditch, all right? I had dropsy in the ditch. I also needed to recognize that I needed help out. And I was able to run to the Orth Ranch and Kelly and Michelle drove the truck, hooked up a tow strap, and yanked me out. I wish I was as quick to recognize the spiritual dishes I slide into. The Pharisees remained silent. You know, their desolate house had become their home. And they were not willing to be gathered under the wings and, and they were so entrenched in their Sabbath keeping law. You know, that they thought 
that doing good was evil on that day. They thought that doing good was evil on the Sabbath day. And Jesus said, what? You know, don't you pull out a donkey or, or a son out of a ditch immediately when they fall into it on this day? Come on, wake up. They wielded the law as a sword to bring death and not to be gathered to Christ and everlasting life as was its intent. And that's what the law's intent is to do. You know, maybe you're not in that rut, but I know, I know I've struck a chord with somebody today. Even if that somebody is me. Are we willing to leave our ruts? Humble ourselves, give up our arrogant, divisive trajectories to ask for help, forgiveness, and healing out of the ditch. To come running to the shelter under the wings of our Savior Jesus Christ. Are we willing? 1 Corinthians 1, start with verse 9. God who has called you into his fellowship with his Son Jesus Christ our Lord is faithful. I appeal to you brothers in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that all of you agree with one another. So that there may be no divisions among you. And that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. And you know, isn't that an awesome passage there? Yes, this is my appeal. Let's draw to the Lord. Let's, let's, let's gather together. And that's where his thought is. And then in verse 11 he says, My brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. I mean this, one of you says, I follow Paul, another I follow Apollos, another I follow Cephas, still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? You know, Paul tries to disconnect his name from, from this. He says, if, if my name is bringing division, you know, erase it, take it away. You know, it's, it's not about Baptists or Pentecost. It's about Christ. Can we, can we agree? Is Christ divided? I mean this, verse 12. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Of course not. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. You know, I'm thankful that I did not baptize any except Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say that you were baptized into my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of human wisdom. Lest the Christ of, cross of Christ be emptied of its power. But for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. There it is. There's our cross. There's our, there's our place that we need to be. God, you know, I need to be at the foot of the cross. I'm a sinner. And unless you repent, you too will die in your sins. You know, the purpose of this passage is to bring us to there. To be gathered in unity under the wings of our Savior. We all need that, right? Can we agree on that? Whew. You know, the climate's changing. The government is dysfunctional, and the winds of waves of doctrines of man are unstable and divisive. You know, the, getting man's wisdom in there to think how, how we can figure God out, you know, when we can't even figure out our own lives. And we divide over those things. You know, if your house has left you desolate... Quit spinning your tires in the rut of death. High centered on your pride and arrogance. Recognize it. Repent from it. Ask for help. Let that strap of love pull you out and return to the stability of the solid truths of God's word. Gathered 
under the secure wings of our Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you and we ask, Lord, that you get us. You get our attention. Lord, so many times we, we, we think, you know, by our devices or our instruments that we're going somewhere. Our speedometers reach in 100, but Lord, help us to see that if we're stagnant, we're stagnant. We're not going anywhere. If we're stuck in our own doctrine and not your doctrine of becoming like Christ. Lord, teach us to come front center to Jesus. Not only in geographic sense or, or in a heart sense, but also in a sense of who we're becoming so that we can be like Christ. Because that's your goal and your will for our lives. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.